We turn this morning to Exodus chapter 20 and Romans chapter 8. The book of Exodus chapter 20 and the epistle of Paul to the Romans chapter 8. Let's hear the word of God. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honour your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbour, you shall not covet your neighbour's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, You speak with us, and we will hear but let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make anything to be with me, gods of silver or gods of gold. You shall not make for yourselves. An altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. And if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone, for if you use a tool on it, you have profaned it. Nor shall you go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. And then from the Epistle of Paul to the Romans, chapter 8, and from verse 18. Romans chapter 8, and from verse 18. Let's hear the word of God. For I consider that the suffering of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labours with birth pangs together until now. And not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of the body. 
for we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who can bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. May God bless his reading on his word. Let's turn to uh, Revelation, the book of Revelation, and chapter 21. Let's hear the word of God. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the water, the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also she had great and high walls with twelve gates, and twelve angels at the gates, and the names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of, Israel, of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me 
had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth and height are equal. Then he measured it wall, its walls, 144 cubits according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. And the construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundation of the wall of the city was adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. Twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was one pearl, and the sit street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honour into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, and there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and the honour of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter in anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who's, who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there, they need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign for ever and ever. Now we've been looking at this for the past few weeks, at these closing chapters of the book, book of Revelation, and these last six chapters, as we've seen, are John's account of two things. Uh, firstly, the, the final judgment of the world, and secondly, the final destiny of of the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Since the world is represented here as, uh, or by Babylon, and the Church is represented by Jerusalem, we've also had in these uh, closing chapters, uh, as it were, the tale of, of two cities, Babylon the godless, secular, uh, materialistic world, Jerusalem standing for the people of God, the ransomed Church, of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this last section of the book, then, these closing six chapters, it is the destiny of those two cities that we have been reading of and thinking about. Certainly, John is speaking to us here of the end of time. Uh, the last chapter in the history uh, the, the, of the world, the closing of the old order of things and the opening of the, the new. Now, we've been looking at all those things as they relate to Babylon, the material secular world in all its godlessness, this world organized, as it were, without God and against God. In the previous chapters up to the end of uh, chapter 20, we've seen the destruction of Babylon and the ultimate judgment of the inhabitants of Babylon before the great white throne. But this morning we're coming to the second of these two themes, to the final destiny of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the background of, for this description, as we see there in verse uh, 1 of chapter 21, is the passing away of the old order. Uh, we see it in that phrase of verse 4. The former things are passed away. And that refers to the passing away of the old world, the old creation, and its replacement by the new creation. So verse 1, Now I saw a new heaven... And a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no more sea. 
Now, the whole of Scripture leads us to expect precisely this. When Adam fell in Genesis 3 in the garden and sin entered the world, the effect of that went far beyond man himself and his immediate situation. Uh, sin's effect reaches out beyond man and his situation, his personal circumstances, to the whole of the created order. It is all affected. And so in Genesis 3, God says to Adam, Cursed is the ground for your sake. More than man the sinner is judged and cursed. But the curse also extends to the created order, to the universe in which man is set. Romans 8, uh, 18 and following, you remember the Apostle Paul, as we read just a few moments ago, takes up that very same theme as he compares the suffering of the present time with our future glory. And in so doing, he is anticipating there in Romans 8 much of what we read here in chapter 21 of Revelation. So Romans 8 and verse 18, I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God, referring, of course, to the last days. And then in verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labours with birth pangs together until now. Now, we might be very familiar with the idea of man uh, as a fallen creature being redeemed by grace in this world and as such groaning within himself, waiting for that day. It's the groaning of a protesting nature, protesting that it's unfinished, uh, longing uh, to reach its intended consummation, longing for the full salvation that God has, has promised. And that full salvation is only going to come on this day that we read of here in Revelation 21. So our own nature, Paul says, is groaning, it's crying out like a woman in childbirth waiting to be uh, delivered. That's the picture Paul uses there, isn't it, in, in Romans 8, um, verse uh, 23 and following. Not only that, but we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption the redemption of our body. For we are saved in this hope, he says. So he's saying that there's this dimension to the salvation that God brings to his people, yet to be experienced by God's people, infinitely more glorious than anything we have known so far. There is a glory still to come for the people of God. And he says that the entire created order is caught up in that and involved in that groaning. It waits in hope. Well, what is it waiting for? What is it hoping for? It's waiting for the new heavens and the new earth in which only righteousness dwells, for the recreation, for the full consummation of redemption, when the lion will lie down with the lamb, and so on. That new order, the new order that is to come, in which... Uh, Believers have been raised from the dead in glorified bodies to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in the new creation. Now the body that he will give to us, says the Apostle Paul, in that day, he says it to the Philippians, will be like unto his glorious body. That's the hope in which we've been saved, he says. And this chapter in Revelation is so important because of this essential element then of God's salvation because we have been saved in hope I have been saved in hope and that means that for the Christian the best is yet to be if you're a saved man if you're a saved woman well that's a wonderful thing 
but still you are saved in hope. And the hope is for something better than we have now. The Christian may well have experienced and enjoyed something of the wonderful things of God in this world, the riches of God's grace experienced in this world, even something of the presence of God drawing near to them in this world, coming down to them, as it were, even in this life. But still, we say, eye has not seen and ear has not heard. It has never entered into your imagination the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And Revelation 21 then is this wonderful manifestation of the things God has prepared for us and the entire created order is going to be involved in it. So you see, just as there's a cosmic dimension to the fall and the whole of creation being affected by the fall of man into sin, so there's this cosmic dimension to redemption and salvation that still awaits that last day when the whole creation will be renewed and re recreated. Now, as I've mentioned, when the Apostle Paul describes the resurrection body, he likens it to Christ's glorious resurrection body. And this, I think, probably sets down a sort of guideline to help us in thinking about the new creation, because the new creation is... Um, is obviously the background against which we are to understand uh, Revelation 21 and 22. Christ's glorious body, as Paul calls it in uh, Philippians 3.21, has both a continuity and a discontinuity with his physical body. For example, as we read in the Gospels, we see a continuity of his physical body with the glorified body in that people recognized him. They knew him when they saw him. They could touch him and handle him. Indeed, he commanded them to do just that. Touch me, handle me, and see I am not a ghost. His glorious body was a body in which he ate and drank, a body from which he spoke to his disciples. It had a recognized form there was a recognizable continuity between his resurrection body and the physical body that was his during his earthly ministry but there was also a discontinuity wasn't there there was something different about the resurrection body different from his earthly physical body it seems to have had the capacity to appear and disappear it had the capacity to appear in a locked room to enter unhindered into that room. Ultimately, that resurrection body ascended into the clouds and to the presence of God. So there was a continuity and a similarity, but also a discontinuity, something very distinctive about the resurrection body. And that combination, I think, is a, is a sort of guideline to help us in thinking about the new creation. Sometimes people ask what the new creation will be. I suspect that the answer is not that it will be totally new, nor that it's going to be just like the old, but that there will be this continuity and discontinuity, a similarity and yet something very distinct. So we read in verse 1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no more sea. Some are disappointed by the fact that there's no more sea. Um, if, if you particularly like the coast and the sea, uh, that might disappoint you. But in Scripture, the sea is often used symbolically uh, of trouble. The wicked, says Isaiah, are like the troubled sea that cannot rest uh, that, that's why there's no sea in the new creation, as John describes it for us here. It's intended to convey the idea of the total absence of all imperfection. And then against that background, in verse 2, John goes on to describe the final glory of the church of Jesus Christ. And again, he's doing it in symbolic form. And the symbolism in this section of the Bible is both biblical and numeric symbolism 
and we've seen this several times already in the book, and the symbols are to be interpreted. In other words, they are not descriptions for us to visualise, like pictures, but they are symbols for us to interpret. You, you go out to a shop and you need to use their facilities and you see a symbol of a man. Well, you, you don't see men actually shaped like that symbol. It, you know what the symbol means. It's directing you to their facilities. And we use symbols like this all of the time in society. They're not intended for us to picture something. They're intended to be interpreted in a certain way. And that's what we're having here in this book. They're to be interpreted. And the numbers in the book are not statistics for us to count up. Or measure, but they are symbols to be interpreted. So how does John describe here the people of God in these symbols? Well, first of all, in verses 2 to 8, you see them as a beautiful bride adorned for her husband. And then in verse 9 to the end, you see the church as a walled city. And then in chapter 22, verses 1 through 5, you see the church as a watered garden. Those are the symbols that John uses. Now the one thing all these images speak about is perfection. All of these symbols, the adorned bride, the walled city, the watered garden, each one is speaking to us about something perfect. Evidently, you and I are not really equipped to even begin to understand the wonder of what John is speaking about here. This is why John has to describe it in symbols for us. But it's important that we at least under, try to understand what the symbols are, are teaching us. So first of all, the church is a beautiful bride in verse 2. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So straight away you can see there, that is not something for you to try to visualize because it's just not possible. You cannot visualize a city that looks like a bride or a bride that looks like a city. It can't be visualized and you're not intended to visualize it. Rather, you're intended to interpret the symbols. And the whole point of these symbols is that this is a fulfilment of what we read about in, in Ephesians chapter 5. You remember that famous passage that's so often uh, referred to when we're talking about married life, husbands and wives, from verse uh, 25 of Romans chapter 5. If you've got your Bible, perhaps you'll turn that page, page up. This is the church as God has planned and purposed it. And in Ephesians 5... Paul uses the picture of Christ and the church in order to encourage husbands and wives to act properly towards one another. And this is what he says in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that, he should, that she should be holy and without blemish. Now, of course, you and I are the church. Those who know and love the Lord are his church. But when does the Lord present the church to himself in this condition, radiant, glorious, without spot, wrinkle or blemish, but holy and blameless. Well, it's in the, in the fulfillment referred to in Revelation 21. We see through John's eyes the day when the church, perfected by God, reaches the end of Christ's purpose for the church when he said, I will build my church, when he purchased the church with his precious blood, as he's laboured in the church through the running centuries and through the whole of your life as a Christian, as a 
child of God. This is what it is all for. This is what it's all about. Do you see that? The glorious church of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's purpose is all bound up in bringing this about. And it's coming down from the throne of God, says John. That's where the Lamb is, you remember. And he presents his church, holding it, as it were, before the whole of creation, the new creation. It's his great masterpiece. This is the glorious and the most beautiful of God's creation. And the Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians 3 that the whole of creation, the whole of the created order, is going to gasp with wonder at the beauty of this thing that God has made called his church. That's what God is preparing us for. That's what God has always had in mind. And that's the end of his purpose for the church. This is what he has in mind as he moulds your life, as he fashions you, as he brings you through trial and difficulty and troubles and distress, when he humbles you, when he causes you to see the darkness that is in you and your sin. In every experience you encounter as a child of God, in every single one, God has his eye on that day when the work will be complete. Without spot, without wrinkle, a glorious church. In verse 6 of Revelation 21, he says, it is, it is done. Now, it had been done a long time before. But now the work the word rings out through, throughout all heaven and all the new creation. It is done. The work is complete. It is com finished. That is the hope and the prospect that we must keep in mind. And this is what God is working toward in your life and my life today and every day. This is what it's all for. And this is what it's all about. Every sin, every failure... All the pains, all the suffering, every experience of loss, death and mourning. He tells us here, they're all to be dismissed in verse 4. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And sin itself will be purged from us. Every manifestation of it will be cast into the lake of brimstone and fire verse 8 the cowardly unbelieving abominable murderers sexually immoral sorcerers idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death and verse uh, 27 there shall by no means enter in anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie but only those who's who are written in the lamb's book of life that is god's people perfected and glorified in the last day and that's why it says in verse uh, three i heard a loud voice from heaven saying behold the tabernacle of god is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and god himself shall be with them and be their god but we have to remember of course that that's a description of the glory to come. It is the new heavens and the new earth. And it's a great error to take what the scriptures describe as be belonging to heaven and the eternal state and to speak as if it belonged to earth today. No more pain, says John. Where is there no more pain? Well, in that heavenly realm. So when people tell you that sickness and pain are contrary to the will of God and that uh, when you are feeling ill, you need to claim your healing, that is a gross confusion of the intended end and our present condition between being a member of the church militant here on earth and being a member of the church triumphant there in glory. In this world, you can't avoid death. You can't avoid mourning, crying and pain. We know the reality of, the tempta of temptation and sin in this world. We have been saved 
from the penalty of sin in this world and we may by God's grace be saved from its dominion and power but we're not yet de delivered from its presence. But one day, John says, we shall be. One day we shall be. That's the glorious picture of the beautiful bride that he shows us here. And then from verse 9, notice secondly the walled city. And again, it's symbolical. It's a biblical symbol and a numerical symbol. Back in Isaiah 60, the prophet speaks of the people of God being called a city. The city of the Lord, Zion, uh, the Holy One of the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah chapter 60 and verse uh, 14. Also the sons of those who afflicted you shall come bowing to you, and all those who despised you shall fall prostrate at the soles of your feet, and they shall call you the city of the Lord, Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Verse 18, violence shall no longer be heard in your land, neither wasting nor destruction within your borders, but you shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give light to you, but the Lord will be to you an everlasting light and your, and your God your glory. Your sun shall no longer go down, nor shall your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and the days of your mourning shall be ended. Do you see how the imagery there of Isaiah is just taken up by John as he describes the new Jerusalem? When John comes to describe the city of God to us as a picture of the people of God, he takes up the exact same elements that Isaiah uses there in chapter uh, chapter 60. The first thing he says is that its glory and its light is the glory of God. Revelation 21 verse 11, having the glory of God, her light was like a most precious stone. Verse 23, the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it, and the Lamb is its light. Verse 24. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honour into it. So, the glory and light of it are the glory of God. Secondly, its walls are its security. That's what the walls were built for. And notice where the foundation of the, world, the, the church lies. Verse 14. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Verse 19, foundation of the walls of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. First foundation a jasper, and, and so on. Now that image is designed to impress upon us the sheer preciousness of the foundation. The foundation that gives the wall stability and uh, its security are the twelve apostles of the Lamb, he says in verse 14. What's the significance of that? Well, it is that the twelve apostles are those to whom the Lord Jesus Christ revealed the truth of the gospel. That's what Paul tells us, isn't it, in Ephesians, again at the end of uh, Ephesians in chapter 2. Um, he, he refers to the apostles there in verse uh, 19. You therefore are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And what he's speaking about there is revealed truth. The revelation of God's truth through the apostles. Now, how do you build a church today upon the apostles? You build it upon Holy Scripture. We see that in heaven. And the pattern is to be followed here on earth. Holy Scripture and Holy Scripture alone 
is the foundation of the church. Apostolic truth, the revealed word of God. We build and we stand on that. And if we allow that foundation to be eroded, then the whole structure will crumble and disintegrate. And there's a message in that, isn't there, for the church. The Apostle John, you remember, is writing this letter in the first place to those suffering Christians in the first century. He's saying to them that it's apostolic truth. It's the apostolic gospel alone upon which the church can be built if it's going to last. And that's equally true in our day and our generation. Notice quickly it has 12 gates, this city. 12 gates, 12 angels, the names of the 12 tribes written on them. John is leaving us with no doubt, isn't he, that uh, he's referring here to the church in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's the foundation of the apostles and prophets. There's the 12 gates with the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 foundations with the 12 apostles, and so on. He's talking about the church, Old Testament and New Testament. But notice the gates are on all sides, on the south, the north, the east, and the west, because the church of the Lord Jesus is gathered from every tribe, every nation, every peoples. And the city is shaped as a perfect cube, verse 16. It is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its, as its breadth. And he measured the city with its reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. And there's a symbolism, as we know, in that number 12. We've seen it many times. 12 is the number of the church. A thousand is 10 cubed. 10 is the number of perfection. So here's the church in its perfected state. 12,000 furlongs, it says here in the New King James. The original is a stadia. What that means is if it were measured out in uh, literalistic terms, it would be on one side stretching from London to Athens. And it's a cube. So it's as high as it is wide and long. And obviously then, you're not to try to visualise this city. But we're to interpret the symbols, which are intended to convey something vast and glorious beyond our imagination. It's a description of the people of God. And the central reality of the city is the presence of God. Verse 22, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of, the, of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And uh, there's no need of a temple because the whole city is filled with the presence of God and God's glory. He is everywhere found amongst his people. There's no need to go to a temple to find the presence of God. Because there is no place in this city where God is not present. And then finally, I'm conscious our time is going, the church has a watered garden in these opening verses of chapter 22. And it's, it's obviously the restoration of Eden into something infinitely more glorious. In Eden, paradise is lost, but in heaven, it's regained. Verse 1, he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And the river speaks of life, eternal life, spiritual life, salvation life. It's a symbol obviously well understood in the East, the ancient Near East, and the Near East still today. But it's drawn from the prophecies of Ezekiel and the prophecy of Zechariah, where the water flows from the temple and from beneath its gates as a symbol of an abundance of eternal life. And there's the tree of life we're told of in verse 2. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the trees were the, for the healing of the nations, which tells us that in this glorified uh, condition of God's people in heaven, there is going to be a superabundance of provision made for them. We know God's provision for us, don't we, in this life. And sometimes we're overwhelmed by the provision God gives us in this life. But that is going to be exceeded 
in the glory of the world to come in a way that we presently cannot comprehend. There will be no need because every need will be so abundantly met. And the superabundance of the supply is seen in the 12 harvests of 12 fruits. Every month the harvest of fruit from these trees. And again, it's not hard to see what that would have meant to the contemporaries of John as he wrote this letter to them. They were suffering all manner of privation for their faithfulness to Christ. And he's saying here, look, there is a superabundant supply for the people of God in that day. This is what awaits us. This is what God is preparing for us. And the great characteristic of the watered garden is there the people of God will engage in one activity. Verse 3. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. It's the word worship. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. His servants will worship him face to face. So those are the three pictures. They're glorious pictures. They're intended to teach us many things. Supremely, seven things, I think, because this revelation will stick with seven, that seems appropriate for us in this book. It is that the presence of God is to be our chief delight. Verse, verse 3. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and will be their God. The presence of God is to be our chief delight. Not God's gifts, not God's power, but his presence. He will be with his people. Secondly, the glory of God is to be the true glory of his people. Verse 11. Having the glory of God, her light was like a most precious stone. It has no glory, you see, of its own. But its true glory is the glory of God. It's as we gaze, as it were, through a glass darkly into the glory of the Lord that we are changed into the same glory. The glory of the Lord is the true glory of the people of God. The truth of God is the only foundation for the people of God. We stand on the foundation of of the apostles. The throne of God is the centre of life for the people of God. Chapter 22 and verse 3, there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. It's the centre of everything, and the life of heaven and glory is that moral obedience to the decrees of the one who sits on the throne. The worship of God is the constant activity of God's people. His servants shall serve him. They shall worship him. The sufficiency of God is the nourishment of God's people. And there is a superabundant supply for them. And finally, the holiness of God. The holiness of God is the true beauty of God's people. Chapter 21 and verse 2. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 10. Carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Which is why Paul says what he says in Ephesians 5, that God has set his heart on this, the beautifying of his church. Holiness is to be the true beauty of God's people. Do you remember when we looked at Babylon, we saw that feature, that there was glamour but no beauty? Well, in the new heavens and the new earth, in his church we will see true beauty. It's what God has set his heart on, and everything he's doing in your life, in the past and today and until that day, is intended for this one thing, to bring you to this place. This is the full 
revelation of the purpose of God and it will be seen in the beauty and the holiness of his church. What a privileged people you are. What a privilege belongs to us that we are the people of God. May he bless his word to us.